Let's hit the biology. Now we're on lab 25. That's the algae. We can find this on page 265 in your lab text. We're going to look at some protists. Uh, not all the protists. It's a very, very diverse group. But uh, the algae is what we're going to focus on here because um, it is likely they were the ancestors of plants. So your objectives for your test. Number one, what is their economic and ecological importance? Yes, you've eaten algae many times. Two, how are the five phyla of algae classified? Three, you need to be able to distinguish the name of the five phyla. And four, you need to know a little bit of the life history of algae. So there's some pictures here. We've got some green algae off to the left. Uh, typically, they have green chlorophylls, making them green. Brown algae has a different type of pigment that is used for photosynthesis that makes it brown. Um, and those are commonly seen off the California coast in these very large kelp forests. But not all brown algae, off to the right, uh, is these long kelp uh, tree-like structures. Some of them just adhere to rocks and are more like grasses in the sea. In a nutshell, algae are a morphologically diverse group of distantly related plant-like organisms. They range in size from a single-celled organism to giant 100-foot-long kelps. They live in all ecosystems from aquatic to terrestrial and play an important role by providing oxygen and founding aquatic food chains as the primary producers or autotrophs. They are the most ancient group of eukaryotic organisms, about 1.8 to 2.5 billion years ago, and one phylum, the green algae, led to the evolution of land plants. Their taxonomy is complex, so we'll focus only on five phyla. We can see some pictures of various types of algae off to the right. We have a colonial type algae called Volvox, which we'll be looking at in the lab. We have some dinoflagellates. We have some diatoms. Um, and then we, of course, have our multicellular kelp. What traits unify all algae? Well, one, they're eukaryotic, which means they have a membrane-bound nucleus and organelles. Two, they're biologically primitive, no or few organs. Three, they're autotrophic, so they obtain energy via photosynthesis using various pigments. Four, they have a cell wall. So these cell walls can be made of different substances, but they provide structure, and we also see those in land plants. Five, they reproduce sexually and asexually, as most primitive life. Asexual is most common, and we can see that uh, they reproduce by fragmentation or mitosis. And sex is common in multicellular species. Six, offspring dispersed via spores in the water. And seven, they have a haploid dominant life cycle, which is most of them. Some of them have a diploid dominant life cycle. What traits are used in algal classification? So number one, the growth form. So there can be unicellular, filamentous, like a hair, colonial, like a round ball, or multicellular. Two, their color are from their photosynthetic pigments. So again, green algae comes from more of a chlorophyll A or B, and brown comes from more of psychobilins or other types of photosynthetic pigments. Three, they have storage compounds. So sometimes they'll have oil, sometimes they'll have starch. Sometimes they'll have both. Four, their cell wall composition. So sometimes we'll find cellulose, sometimes we'll have glass, like our diatoms. And five, they have organ complexity. So they have sex organs, sometimes their uh, sex organs are unicellular, sometimes they're multicellular. What are the ecological roles of algae? Well, number one, they live everywhere. They can be in freshwater, marine, terrestrial, snow. We find them in Antarctica to the Arctic. Two, they produce 50% to 60% of global oxygen. Three, they form the base of aquatic food chains. Since water covers more than 70% of the planet, they are the base of the entire food chain for the Earth. Uh, they are abundant primary producers. Four, large algae provide a lot of habitat. So those kelp forests have diverse marine ecosystems. We have a video uh, of sea otters and how they relate to kelp and how they make their home around kelp forests. And then off to the right, we have another video 
and it shows just the biodiversity within a kelp forest. And remember that kelp forests anchor sea otters while they eat and rest. So what, ha what will happen is the sea otter will go to the bottom and find, say, an abalone. And he has a couple of pockets of fur on his belly. So he'll come up um, with the abalone and a couple of rocks. And then when he gets to the top, he doesn't want to drift out to sea. He wants to stay around more abalone. So he anchors himself by kind of having it lay over his belly. Then he takes his, the rocks out of his little pouches and he beats the shell with the, onto the abalone, cracking it open and then eating it. What are the economic uses of algae? Well, there are many. These are just a few. Diatomaceous earth. So those are diatoms. They're a type of algae. And they have a cell wall made out of glass. So it can be used as an abrasive and absorptive. We can find it in toothpaste, pool filters, and desiccants. Auger is another example of a use of algae, especially red algae. So it's a gelatin-like medium for growing bacteria and keeping food moist like cookies and yogurt. And everybody likes cookies, especially cookies dipped in yogurt. Algin comes from brown algae. And this is a cell wall constitute used as a stabilizer or emulsifier in dairy and baked goods. We eat this all the time especially me because I love cheese. Pollution control. Sewage treatment and fertilizers. Uh, we can use algae to make biofuels. So we have a video on that. Um, we can use them to study bacteria. There's so many econo economic uses. Um, on a daily basis, I would say that we ingest a little bit of algae. Here are our five algae phyla that you must know. You have to know the common names too. So chlorophyta are the green algae. They usually have uh, chlorophylls A and B in them. Examples are Chlamydomonas, Spirogyia, Cladophora, and Volvox. Number two, Phaophyta, which is the brown algae. We have an example in lab called Fucus. Three, Rhodophyta is red algae. An example would be Polysophonia. Four, Bacillariophyta, or Chrysophyta, are the diatoms. Example are diatoms, and we can see those in diatomaceous earth. And finally, five, Dinozoa, or Pyrophyta, are the dinoflagellates. And the example we have is Peridinium. Let's take a look at Phylum Chlorophyta in detail. These are the green algae. There's 7,000 morphologically diverse species. And these are the ancestors of modern land plants. So what makes them a green algae? Well, they have cell organization and growth form. So all four types are seen in this phylum. We can see unicellular, the entire organism is only one cell. We can see filamentous, a thread-like series of single cells, typically uh, one after another. Colonial can be aggregation of single cells in a colony that function as one organism. Or multicellular, a growth form like our own that have involves cells highly organized into tissues. The shared traits of algae and land plants, one, they have pigment, some type of chlorophyll, and there are several different kinds. Two, they f have food storage. So they use starch. Like plants, algae need to store energy for use in times of low light or no light, like at nighttime. And three, the cell wall component has to be made out of cellulose. Let's look at a unicellular chlorophyta. An example would be Chlamydomonas. We find them in damp soil, lakes, and ponds. Their life cycle is they're haploid dominant, and they go undergo asexual reproduction via mitosis. Something cool about them, uh, they swim towards the light using what's called a stigma, which is a red light sensing eye spot, and two flagella that beat rapidly. Their defense, if their habitat dries up, Sex is undertaken to create a resistant, dormant zygospore until the environment is suitable, and then that zygospore goes, undergoes meiosis and produces more haploid individuals. Now let's talk about a filamentous chlorophyllin. An example would be Spirogyra. It's unique in that it has spirally arranged chloroplasts. You can see a picture up to the top right of that. 
It's actually not a spiral, it's a helix, but biologists seem to be pretty lax about the difference between a helix and a spiral, but not when it comes to DNA. The habitat we find them are streams that have some flow, not necessarily uh, turbulent rivers like the Colorado through Cataract Canyon. The energy, they're non-modal, but they float on the surface of water to excess light. Their life cycle, they have one and asexual. They reproduce via fragmentation. Then they have a sexual part to their lifestyle. One strain donates its haploid nucleus to a different strain. We can see this off to the bottom right picture. Um, and how this one donates its nucleus is through something called a conjugation tube. And then the nuclei fuse to make a diploid zygote. Um, so you can see that conjugation tube and the zygote there. And then of course that zygote is going to go through meiosis and then produce four haploid spores that grow into new filaments. Their defense is the product of sex, the zygote, will become resistant. It's called a zygospore and eventually yield offspring in the form of the haploid spores. But that resistant zygospore can go through periods of drought fairly easily and then when the rains come again and our stream fills up again then the offspring start to come off and you see it grow uh, via asexual reproduction. Now let's look at a colonial chlorophyton. An example would be Vulvox. Its habitat, we find it in ponds and moist soil. Its life cycle is asexual. So the mitosis of mother cells yield daughter cells that are released into the mother colony where they form daughter colonies protected by the outside harm. So we can see that in the top right hand picture. There's a mother colony with eight daughter colonies within it. They do have a sexual part of their life cycle. They have oogamy, which, or oogamy, which is a highly modal sperm that swims to fuse with a large non-modal egg. Their energy, so of course they're going to use sunlight, but the synchronized colony swims toward light, each cell using its two flagella and its red light sensing eye spot. Their defense is the product of oogamy is a tough zygospore, again, that can survive stressful conditions like drought. There's a video in the bottom right hand corner I'd like you to take a look at of the uh, the Volvox swimming and then that picture at the bottom right is a close-up of individual cells within the mother colony. Now a multicellular chlorophyton is the our example is the ulva or sea lettuce. It's multicellular so the body is called a thallus. That's something you're gonna have to remember for future labs. The habitat is in the ocean typically tide pools attached to rocks or sometimes can be free-floating. The life cycle, of course, we have an asexual uh, clonal haploid spores butt off the thallus, or their sexual uh, part of their life cycle, or they have oogamy, and the definition on the previous slide produces diploid zygospore. The energy is non-modal, um, no flagella like we saw in Volvox, but floats on the surface of water to pho photosynthesize. We have gas-filled parts to this sea lettuce that allow it to float. We can see the thallus in the top right hand picture, remember that's the body, and in the bottom right hand picture we see Alaskan sea lettuce uh, left on the rocky shore at low tide. Now we're moving on to phylum Phaophyta, which is the brown algae. We know these commonly as kelp and or brown seaweed. Their habitat is coastal rocks or the ocean floor. So the kelp forests provide critical habitat to marine life. Something that unites them is they have a gelatinous sheath that protects them from drying out at low tide. They're unique, so they're multicellular with brown pigment, and they have complex morphology. They have a stipe, hold fast, a float, which is a, also called a bulb, and blades, which are like their leaves. Uh, the life cycle, they're diploid dominant, but they do have asexual spores that butt off the blades. And then the sexual uses complex multicellular sex organ, organs called conceptacles. Their energy, despite being brown, they still photosynthesize. The reason for this is the uh, pigment called fucoxanthin is best used at colder temperatures. So we find them typically in the Alaskan currents or Antarctic currents. Um, their defense, they don't really have defense against predators, 
like sea urchins, but the presence of sea otters keep the populations in check and enable brown algae to flourish. So let's take a look at the bottom right hand picture. We can see the stipe, the bulb, and the fronds, or something called, or blades. We can see in that left hand picture next to it uh, a whole bunch of those floats that allow it to stay erect and reach toward the sun. Some kelp grow one to two feet per day under the right conditions with as much nutrients as they can handle. And then in the top right picture we see a person holding giant kelp. And they can grow 100 meters long, but their blades are typically not longer than more than a few meters. Um, you can see a giant blade as that guy's picking it up. It covers his whole body. Now let's look at the anatomy of brown algae. Uh, we talked about a hold fast. We can see that hold fast off to the right at the bottom of that stalk. That's what attaches to rocks. It's kind of like roots, but doesn't really have a function of absorption. It's more for just holding onto rocks. The blades, we talked about that. They're very flat. They increase the surface area for photosynthesis. The stipe, there's, they're up to 100 meters long, so that's kind of like the stalk or stem and allows algae to reach its blades from the ocean floor to the sunlit surface waters. And then those conceptacles we were talking about, they're bumpy or swollen branch tips containing two reproductive organs. They contain ogonia, which are female, and they produce big sessile eggs. And also they have antheridia, which are the male parts that produce tiny motile sperm. The egg and sperm meet to form a zygote, which grows into an adult kelp. Moving on to phylum rhodophyta, which are the red algae, we find these guys in tropical oceans, mostly. So they have a different type of pigment that's red called phycobilin, and that is typically does better in warmer waters. They're typically free-floating with many of those gas-filled chambers that keep them on the surface. They're unique because they're multicellular with the red pigment, which absorbs the blue-green light of deep water. Uh, their life cycle, so they're diploid dominant, much like our brown algae, but no conceptacles. They do have a sexual and asexual lifestyle, so they're a complex cycle with non-modal gametes, and then the asexual, the spores are released from these things called cystocarps, where meiosis occurs. We can see a picture of several different uh, Rhodophyta examples. At the top right, we can see the entire thallus of, the, of a Rhodophyta example, and then we see a multicellular branch. We can see at the bottom some Rhodophyta growing at the bottom of the ocean, and then we can see those cystocarps growing uh, where meiosis occurs. Looking at the phylum Basilariophyta or Chrysophyta are the diatoms. There's a movie there showing the moving diatoms. It's very beautiful. Their habitat are the oceans. Ocean floors on kelp are free-floating. They're unique because they're unicellular with golden pigment, and they have a two-part silica shell. And these silica shells can be ornate, and they're made out of glass, so they refract and reflect light in very pretty ways under a microscope. They're bilaterally symmetrical, di meaning two in the word diatom. Their energy, how they get energy is they swim towards light using water density changes to control their buoyancy, or by secreting slime. They're a polysaccharide ooze to slide along the ocean floor or a rock or other algae. Typically they're adults or haploid only, but they do go through asexual and sexual reproduction. And for their ecology, they're oil-rich plankton eaten by aquatic animals. These are the algae that produce the majority of the oxygen that you breathe. Yes, so you're breathing oxygen that came from these small diatoms. Our last algae phyla that we're going to look at is the dinozoans or pyrophodans. These are the dinoflagellates. We find them in the ocean and they're typically free swimming. They're unique because they have a unicellular body that is armored with cellular plates which create two grooves from which two flagella emerge. And we can see that in the middle uh, picture off to the right. Their life cycle, they're haploid dominant, but they both have uh, asexual and sexual reproduction. So asexual is very fast via mitosis, but sexual is only during unfavorable conditions. 
Their ecology, um, they're a large component of marine phytoplankton and produce red tides in polluted waters, which is a very serious problem off the coast of Los Angeles. And then a factoid, they bioluminesce when threatened. So if you're swimming in the Californian, Southern Californian waters at night, you'll see the water begin to sparkle, especially in the presence of a new moon when it's very dark. In the bottom right, we can see a video of a dinoflagellate moving in the ocean. Now let's take a further look at red tide, which we can see examples off the coast of Southern California. The culprit is pollution, so we see an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus from sewage runoff or agricultural runoff, or stagnant warm waters in marine areas. The result is a population explosion of dinoflagellates. The impact on the ecosystem is dinoflagellates use a lot of the water's oxygen, and they block sunlight and release these toxins called brevitoxins, and that kills a lot of the fish and marine organisms. So they are a serious problem and can create dead zones uh, around where the ocean isn't managed very well. Something interesting though, they do have uh, bioluminescence and when they are in high concentrations you can see bioluminescent waves. The dinoflagellates think that uh, there's a predator nearby so they light up and you can swim in it. I recommend swimming it in, in small amounts but in the bottom left hand picture if you open up a camera's shutter for a few seconds a person can wave their arms and make a bioluminescent angel, especially in bioluminescent bay. An interesting fact about some dinoflagellates, they can live symbiotically with coral. So these dinoflagellates are called zooxanthellae, and they're endosymbionts of corals, kind of like midichlorians, but for coral. In this relationship, they create a dominant color of the coral and provide sugar to the coral via photosynthesis. So, the coral protects the dinoflagellate, and the dinoflagellate gives it coral. Coral bleaching occurs when the zooxanthellae are stressed or dead, often due to the warming water temperatures. Of the failings that feed me. 